Hello, I'm Graham Fitch, and I'm the co-founder of the Online Academy, um, a wonderful resource for piano teachers and pianists. And we do this clinic once a month where subscribers send in their questions that are usually related to practice, but that can also include things like pedaling, technique, style, which for me is all part of the same package. This is piano technique. It's not just how we move our fingers. Uh, it's all one thing. So I have a bunch of questions here from the subscribers. So let me just get stuck in straight away with a question from Rob concerning Schumann's, uh, the first piece from the Kinderscenen, the of foreign lands and people. Um, he has two questions. First for section A, how to pedal on bar eight. Should I pedal only once at the beginning? I'll show you what this is. I'll, let me play it um, for you. So we all know this piece, Foreign Lands and People. Oh. Long phrase. Now here's bar eight. Now Rob's question it relates to that last bar, whether we play one pedal, since it's a G major chord, it makes uh, perfect sense to do that one harmony in that bar, whereas two harmonies in most other bars, um, most other bars, not exactly all. Do we do this change, which would keep the pattern of pedaling that we've been using, or do we do this and do one pedal through? Now, let me just play you the two of them together and see if you can hear the difference. So this is one pedal. This is two pedals. I don't know the answer to this. I don't think there's an absolute definite answer. I think I would probably want to pedal twice just to preserve the idea of the, the bass having rests in between so you separate the two sounds. I think that's probably where I'd go with it. But I may do it that way one day and differently the day after. I don't think it's that important, actually. So the second question relates to the B section in bars 13 and 14, how to combine the ritardando with the fermata. Um, so we have here the B section. It's lovely here because the, the left hand joins in the melodic line. If I would play, let me play it first. <laughs> and then back into the tempo there. So let's just look at it first, just, just for fun. So if you look at the bass line, the cello line, that bears more of a resemblance to the opening than the top. Perhaps a pair of clarinets on the top. If I combine the top right hand and bottom left hand, I get this dialogue. Uh, and all I then need to do is to put the triplet middle back into the story, and I'm going to just do, do that very lightly. Uh, Here's the spot that Rob is talking about. We see a ritardando and then we see a fermata on that B. Now the fermata just simply tells us to hold onto the note. Um, does it affect the timing of the A and the D that come afterwards? I don't think it does too much. I don't think we'd hold, I don't think we'd do this. late, very late, play the A and the D. I, I would suggest that we play the A and the D um, with the ritardando. In other words, continue the ritardando through those two notes. Let me show you. And then just slink back, slide back into the tempo. It's a very beautiful moment, isn't it? There, let me do it without any retard. a bit abrupt. So let me now soften that return. That's how 
I would read that. It's just a relaxing of the tempo and, and the fermata applies to the whole beat, not just to that one B. That's how I would read it. We, we often do get questions, uh, people ask about harmony, the importance of harmony. This is a really good piece for that because if you look at the first chord, um, G major, what's this chord? If we know that that's a diminished chord, it's a label only. It doesn't tell us how the diminished chord feels, but it gives us a label. And then when, when we look at the diminished chord, let's just see what it does to the music. And, wow. There's the foreign part. That's the bit that where, you, where perhaps when you're a child and you go to a, a, a foreign country and you look at the people and you look at the surroundings and you go, wow, uh, that's the effect of this chord, diminished seventh. Then we get it again. I want to hear a cadence in G major. And here we get it. And then the second half begins in E minor, the relative minor. So you've got a different color for that chord. So a little bit of understanding about harmony is really helpful. Um, it's not essential to be able to play this piece, but it's helpful uh, to play it with understanding. Now, Anne is asking, can you please advise on technique to improve rapid runs of thirds and sixths? Um, specific pieces, Mozart's Nine Variations on a Minuet by Duport, K573, and it's Variation 4 that Anne is asking about. So let me just play you a little bit of this variation. <laughs> So the right hand at the beginning has thirds, and then sixths, and it continues with the sixths. Now the, the, there's lots to say about double notes in piano playing. Uh, it's quite tricky to negotiate double notes. First of all, we have to come up with a good fingering. Um, based on the understanding that, particularly with sixths, we're not going to be able to get legato in both voices. But provided we've got a legato in at least one voice, we can create the impression... I'm looking at the beginning of bar two. Now my fingering for that would be, and this would differ from pianist to pianist, but I like five, four, three on the top and one, one, one on the bottom. I don't want to be stretching my hand out Although I could imagine 5-2, five, 5-1, five, one, 4-1. One. There's several possibilities. I like the legato on the top here. So what I'm doing with my thumb is just re gently releasing. But because I've got a connection there, I can fool you into believing I'm playing legato in both voices. Right? You probably hear that as legato. I would hope you would. And I can use a little touch of pedal as well. And the job is done. Um, at the beginning, I would uh, kind of obviously use five, three, four, two, three, one. Now you've got a choice there. Do you then move across to five, three, which is a little bit of a hop, or do you have something like this? Five, one first, because then the thumb can stay where it was and then move to a three, that's, that's nice and safe. Now I think the next bar is kind of obvious. Four, one, five, two, ditto. Now you'll notice something um, in the way that I'm moving, I hope, when I, I'm looking now at bar three, these sixths. Do you see what I've got going on there? I've got one position of my hand for this sixth, and then an adjusted position for the second sixth. I don't say, ah, I could probably play that all in one position and just lock my hand and do this. I can feel myself tightening up. What I do say is let me move across there with a little adjustment in the wrist. It's a tiny adjustment, a micro adjustment. So that's really important for all double note playing. You can see me doing it there. I'm lined up behind five and three. And here I start the movement. 
So 3-1 needs a different position alignment from 5-1. And what I need to do is, through my wrist, adjust the positions. So let's just look at it. The left hand fingering I would do in bar 5. And then come to a 1-2. Now I quite like this fingering. 4-5-4 four, four on the bass, low, the bass line. And again, just use a thumb-thumb-thumb. feels nice and comfortable. So given that we have a detailed uh, question about double notes, let me give a, a further detail in my response. Very helpful to think of double notes as two voices. So soprano, and I can play that against the left hand. Now, the alto line would be this. Make sure you, when you do this, that you use the fingering that you're going to end up using. So I first of all go through soprano line by itself with the fingering, then alto line by itself with the fingering. And then when I put it together, there are several very traditional ways of practicing. Uh, the first is to give a double tap on, let's say, the top finger first. And then for the next bar. You'll notice that I'm using a tenuto touch, long. And I'm playing my alto very lightly. I want a tenuto there because I want that to be the projected voice, the top voice it is usually going to be the stronger of the two. When I do the double tap the other way around, the double tap for the bottom voice, I'm going to play leggero. And then... Because I want to encourage lightness in my lower voice, the strong fingers uh, versus the weak fingers. So double notes call on the, call on the hand so that the outer part of the hand has to be as strong and as agile as the stronger inner fingers. And that's why they're so good um, to have as technical practice. I've got several exercises that I recommend to the upper intermediate level. You don't want to start double notes too soon on your piano journey, but things like this. I'm going to do hands together, but... If you're going to do an exercise like that, really important that you start off uh, with the understanding of the wrist adjustments and that you start off by allowing drops into the key from further back from the arm. So, do you see what I'm doing there? I'm allowing my arm to take each double note pair. I'm sensing is a vibration um, of my wrist into the key. I'm not trying to do it exclusively with my fingers. Uh, now Peter has asked a question, uh, quite a long question, and it's a very general question, but I think it's a really good question. I'm going to attempt to answer it. Peter says, I have seen how you have demonstrated how your muscle memory is so amazingly developed that you can play a piece without consciously being aware of the notes talking to the camera whilst playing. This can leave you entirely free to put 100% effort into playing musically and artistically rather than worrying about getting the right notes. Sadly, it is very rare that my muscle memory is so well developed. Only those very few pieces which over the years I've played over and over and, and over again. With such pieces, the music can really fr flow freely and is so much more expressive. Can you give any advice on how to speed up 
the building of muscle memory to attain the degree you have demonstrated. It feels so good to be able to play pieces so freely. Whew, big question there. Um, what I'm going to do is to address it in two ways. One is specifically with regard to muscle memory, but I wouldn't I, I wouldn't only use muscle memory. Uh, it appears when, when I play something that I can talk over the top of, um, that I am remembering it only by muscle, that it's much more than that. It's muscle, it's ear, and it's mind, analytical mind. Um, I'm going to give you an example. Let me go with, okay, I think I'll go with one of our study editions here. This is the, we publish here. Um, practice editions with a score at the front. Uh, first of all, there's an introduction. We have the score at the front, or text, and then we have footnotes with um, QR codes. So you scan the QR code and that links to a video, a uh, brief, very, very brief video demonstration of me doing it. And we have also practice worksheets. So I'm looking here at the DBC, um, the La Fille aux Cheveux de Lain, the girl with the flaxen hair. And I have here on my practice worksheet a practice strategies for bar 14, which is this spot. Let me just play you bar 14. We all know the girl with the flaxen hair, right? Very familiar piece. Now there's a little spot here. Let me show you it. that I've been teaching this piece, I can pretty much uh, guarantee that the player is going to have a little issue with that corner because it, it's kind of fiddly. So if I just play it very slowly, we've got four voices, soprano, alto, tenor, bass, if you will. Which we have to play as legato as possible. So what do I do? Simply repeat that over and over and over until the muscle memory takes over? Uh, no. In, in a very short answer to that, I do not keep repeating and playing over and over and over. What I do is I break it down. So the first thing I would do would be to play with the fingering that I'm going to end up using, just the upper voice. Let me just confine myself to that uh, first measure, really. Um, and notice what I do when I do that. I don't do it mechanically. I do it expressively and freely. I'm very concerned that my arm and hand stay free. And that I play with good tone. Then I might go down to my alto voice and do the same job there. Second violin, if you will. Can I hear that as a line? I don't know, let me sing it and see. Yes, I can. So I've heard it, I've felt it. Um, now, when it comes to putting the, the two, uh, I, I would do the same job with my left hand, but let me just go to my practice exercise now uh, for the right hand. I developed a little exercise like this based on the pattern. In other words, I created an exercise from the notes on the page. Let me show you, actually, uh, three exercises. You'll notice I was playing mezzo forte on my top voice and pianissimo on my underneath voice. Second exercise, still metaphor on the top. And the third variant, if you will. And I can really feel those legatos now when I go back to my original. I 
I just feel I've got so much more control over that. Um, however, it's not just a question of the muscles. It's a question of understanding the structure of the music, what key we're in, what Debussy's doing at that time. I mean, I could even take, say, the lower three voices. So in other words, the lower right hand combined with the left hand. And so I just missed off the tune. I could play my upper voice against my bass voice. So there are several stages that I would go through with that passage, um, so that in the end it looks like it's just fantastic muscle memory. It is fantastic muscle memory, but it's a lot more than that. I've understood the structure of the piece. I've listened to every detail of it. Um, something along those lines, Peter, um, I, th I think would give you, give you the best answer. So, moving on to Anne, who asks about the Brahms Intermezzo in A major, uh, Opus 118, number two. Could you please demonstrate the best bars to put in some changes in tempo, forward slash rubato in this piece? Okay, another really big question, and I happen to have in front of me my very own edition of this piece too, um, which has again, lots of footnotes that help um, in the learning with this. But I'm going to go to the Urtext um, score that we have in the front of the publication, because it's easier for me to read it from there. Right, now, once we've chosen a tempo based on Brahms's instruction, andante tenaramente, so andante means moving, it doesn't mean slow, it means moving, uh, tenaramente, tenderly, so I'm going to do some little experiment now. I'm going to play this metronomically, and uh, you will absolutely hate it. Um, I'm going to play quaver, that's eighth note equals eighth note. Let's say something along these lines. And I'm going to aim, it's going to be very difficult for me to do this, to play strictly. I played with good tone, I played with good balance, my pedalling was good, I did everything that it said on the page, but uh, the, the life is not there. I sound like a robot, yes? <laughs> so, what would I do differently? What would I do to make it expressive? Well, little forward, backward, ebb and flow, if, uh, just think of the tide, think of the, um, the waves on a, on a beach. So they come in and then they go back out again. So you've got this constant ebb and flow. <laughs> Backwards, move. See, I, I need a little time at the end of this phrase. So it doesn't sound like I'm pulling that around, I hope. But if I take an average speed for my eighth notes, for my quavers, though that's the average. That's probably the fastest. That's probably the slowest. So what I'm doing is rather than staying in one spot, I am moving from one uh, way of moving through the eighth notes to another. In other words, I'm faster than I'm slower than. So those are just localized inflections. Um, change, small changes in tempo, yes. Uh, actual rubato, uh, yeah, that, the problem of rubato, it's um, forward, backwards, but on a slightly bigger scale. So I feel that it wants to happen here. Let me just see if I can play from here. Uh, yeah, so, th so this spot is it's actually in measure 16. Um, there's a feeling of wanting to go forwards. Maybe even more here. And that coincides with Brahms's longer phrases. We, we see now phrase marks that go longer. Here's the longest phrase mark. To date. I'm moving here 
very different. If I were conducting the beginning, I'm no conductor, but probably at the beginning, tia, 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 I would want to show the slurred pairs, whereas when I come to um, this spot, there's a kind of waltz flavour to that. One, two, three. Three in a bar very much, but the second and the third beats lighter. So it, it, sometimes Brahms writes it in. He writes Pulento, for example, and in, in bar 33 we have Kalando. What does Kalando mean? It means play softer and slower. So... Um, tempo crescendo forwards forwards backwards Payback time. And now the music moves from quavers, eighth note pairs, to triplets. feel with a triplet uh, subdivision is that there's a kind of rolling forwards just naturally so if you think of one and two and three and somewhat square divisions of two squarer divisions of three are more circular so one and two and three and one and uh, two and uh, three and uh, squares to circles so the, there's a natural instinct for this music to want to roll little bit. And then he asks for Pew Lento. Slower. And then there's a writ within the Pulento. So some of these, just to get to final answer to your um, question, Anne, some of these rubatos are written out. Others are implied by either, um, you know, just the, the natural way that we feel music. And, and nobody feels music uh, in the end with a metronome, um, which always leads me to ask the question, why? practice music like this with a metronome? For what possible purpose would you want to even out everything and to sound like a robot? I can't think of it, uh, unless you're so wayward with your general pulse, once or twice with a metronome to show you what, what robotic would be as opposed to your crazy freedom. But as a general kind of day-to-day -day activity, practicing with a metronome in music like this is counterproductive and actually a bit silly if you don't mind my saying so yes it all music has rubato to some extent or other uh, some of it is written out by the composer or implied by the composer others we just have to feel and one person would do it differently from the from the next person um, I hope that answers your questions it's been good to chat with you um, do keep sending me your questions and all the details will be in the description below. I look forward to seeing you for the next practice clinic. Thank you for watching.